Welcome to the D.A.R.E. podcast, where it is all about helping people overcome anxiety and panic attacks. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is free to download at DareResponse.com. Now, without further ado, here is the D.A.R.E. podcast. Hi, everybody. I think I keep bumping Michelle out because I'm logging in. Oh, no, there she is. It worked. (laughs) It's always a little bit tricky in the beginning here. Michelle, can you hear us? Hello. Hi. So, Hi. Sorry, it bumps me out like three times before. That was I me. Know. That was me. <laughs> it shouldn't be like that. I don't get it. Ah. But you guys, don't worry. We got it together this time. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Is there more than one person on here now? <laughs> yes. Oh, we did. Hello. Good. Hi, Marie. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. So good to see you. Good to see you too. And it's so great that everything worked well. Michelle and I were just talking about how we keep messing like Zoom up by bumping each other out or being on the wrong webinar and 20 people waiting for us. (laughs) And another webinar in another world somewhere. I know. All the tech issues. I just logged on to my computer a couple of minutes ago and I just saw all my folders disappear. I was like, we're not too agree. (laughs) Now we need folders. (laughs) <laughs> you're the same as us gonna go well <laughs> yeah how are you good I'm doing good how's everyone good thank you thank you yeah. so you guys we have a special guest today on a special topic you have never seen us cover yet uh, Marie would you like to introduce yourself you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Marie Elena. I am an intuitive eating and eating disorder dietitian. I'm originally Lebanese, but right now I'm physically located in Michigan. So shout out to all the U.S. folks in the comments. Any Lebanese um, Michigans on the call here? <laughs> hi. Very niche group. So we'll- <laughs> um, yeah, I run my virtual private practice beyond food rules and I help folks heal their relationship with food, body image, and just really just live a more peaceful life, I would say. Oh, that sounds awesome. great. We need some of that, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> a little peace. Yeah, cool. yeah. So you guys, isn't this interesting? I think it's a little bit unusual for Dare to cover such a topic, but Michelle and I were thinking that we sure have a lot of folks who struggle with body image, body uh, just this oh, what's the word this dysmorphia dysmorphia, dysmorphia. Not yeah. this, this, I was saying this dysphobia dysmorphia sorry um and as as you know other other stresses in our life that do not have exactly to do with our core anxiety issue but can contribute to it by contributing to our life stress so in general the more at peace we are with ourselves and with certain areas of our life that usually aids the recovery process um, for yeah. panic attacks and, anxiety. and it's a super similar cycle anyway super similar similar process and I talk to a lot of people who have similar coexisting sort of things Absolutely. because it's how I treat my thoughts here's a thought how I treat that thought when I'm when I get involved in behavior to feel better here's a feeling and I have to do something because of this feeling this yeah. just happens to involve a lot of food and body image as opposed to just our run-of-the-mill um does this include IBS um Oh, by the way, uh, Marie Elena, if you, you also have access to our chat. Um, so you yes. can see, the, I don't know if you are able to see. Yeah, that I can okay. see them. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. Do you all have a preference? Would you like me to answer questions as they go or save questions till the end? It's totally up to what works for everyone. Well, I thought as a general rule, we're going to ask the questions first. So we are also interested in our um, guests, right, Michelle? So if we have a question, we're going to start. Because <laughs> um, we yeah. tend to ask questions that we all hear questions that come into us. Yeah. A thousand times. And so we like to ask our frequently asked questions, unless you have some frequently asked, like, what do you hear a lot? What's your, what's, what's your approach? What are you, what are you constantly sending the same message in multiple times that you really want people to get the message about relationships with food and body image and Yeah, I honestly would probably just let you all ask your frequently asked questions. And I I have an inkling it's going to cover most of mine. And if we get to the end and I feel like there's some gaps, I'll definitely fill those in. Sounds cool. And we also got some questions that were submitted uh, via email form. 
Let mm -hmm. me just open this. We have lots and lots. And then whatever doesn't get answered from the last webinar, we keep them on the list. And so then we get new ones. So we've got never short on questions. Yeah. Some of them are not specifically about eating and body image, but yeah. all about anxiety. Definitely. <laughs> all going to be very similar answers. Yeah. That way. So I would like to start. Marie, tell me, do many of your clients experience anxiety around food, exercise, general body image, stuff like that? Yes, I would say 99.999%, just so I don't say 100, <laughs> have, you know, coexisting mental health conditions. I think especially depression and anxiety are mm -hmm extremely common when it comes to, um, you know, having a turbulent relationship with food, um, struggling with body image, having either disordered eating or eating disorders, dieting, all of that. I think there's always some feelings of anxiety, depression, feeling like you're not very happy with your current state. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's, that's a product of diet culture that we really come to a point where we're so untrusting of our bodies and of ourselves. And we just start to feel like I'm a failure. I'm not doing this right. Well, why am I not getting X, Y, Z results? Mm -hmm. Why can't I stick to this thing? And the anxiety piles up and the depression piles up. And yeah, a lot, a lot of that for sure. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me about eating disorders and disordered eating? Yeah. You know, I think it's really just labels more so than, oh, this is a full on diagnosis and this is not. I think where we fall short is with the DSM-5 is, you know, our go-to when it comes to diagnosing eating disorders. And to this day, um, if you meet like certain criteria or a number of, let's say, um, criteria out of like, mm -hmm. okay, like four out of five, you get the label. If you have three out of five, you don't get the label. But really what I see is, you know, if you have issues, it doesn't matter if you really fit the criteria or meet the diagnosis. I think disordered eating is just as severe and just as important to deal with as eating disorders are. And sometimes people don't have access to someone who can give them a diagnosis. Sometimes people um, meet all of the criteria, except let's say for the weight criteria, which is problematic on its own. But disordered eating, eating disorders, I think there's severity in all of them. And I think it's very important to treat them all with the same due diligence. And I think you don't have to fit a certain diagnosis for you to, to know that you know, I, I think I, there is something here and I have to kind of deal with it. Right. We like her, right? Thank <laughs> we do. We do. <laughs> That's how we talk. Doesn't yeah. matter if somebody calls us something or not. Yes. Right. Yes. Cares. Yes. I'm having difficulty with this and, and then I'll help you figure out what it is. There's just a whole bunch of things that are grouped into a absolutely a category mm -hmm. that you don't need to be a category. Yes. We put so much importance on labels and I just, I don't think that's the way to go. Do I you think ever, you look at the person oh, and see you get. Right. Yeah. Do you ever experience people coming and saying, I have an eating disorder? As if that is now, you know, the new level of of bad, of severe. Because this happens to us all the time in anxiety, right? People say, I have anxiety, but now I have a disorder. Well, now I have OCD and pure O. So now I yeah. have two problems and I have wow. GAD. And now we have multiple things when really it's, it's your relationship with anxiety. It's yes. how you talk about anxiety. It's you trying desperately to do something here to involve in patterns of behavior, to get rid of feelings. Yeah. And you see, it kind of comes across in all different, um, different areas. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, labels are really stigmatizing. And I think it doesn't really help with someone's process of care to get so caught up on, you know, on a certain label. I think I definitely, I get two groups of people. I get people who describe their day to day and you can clearly tell if like, you need support, but then they end it with, but I don't have, I, I'm fine. Like I'm okay. And then you get the other group of people who come with you and say like, 
I have this label, I'm freaking out, I don't know what to do. And then when you try to explain, you know, we just need to work on body image, we need to explore your relationship with food, look at your history, talk about trauma. And then I feel like there's some relief there because it is stigmatizing to like the word disorder is such a heavy word and it packs so much negativity around it. And people do struggle with sort of having that always, you know, a part of their identity almost to say, well, I have a disorder, whatever that disorder is. I think it's just never feels good for anyone. We need a new word for disorder. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And everybody in the chat who who, who feels, oh, this hits home. I, I have fallen into the trap of believing, oh, I have a disorder because I have a diagnosis. And now I feel that I need a higher level of care or that I'm especially messed up. Um, post in the chat, we would love to hear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, when we use the term disorder, like when we talk about all of our anxiety groups, yeah. it's like the, the presence, the fluctuating of it, levels of anxiety are not the disorder. It's, I don't like the word, yeah, you all always hear me preface me saying I hate the word, but I use it because yeah. that's what everybody knows. Yeah, it's a disordered treatment of fluctuating levels of anxiety. Absolutely. It's a disordered treatment of our thoughts and feelings and physical sensations, opinions of others, and so it, this is the part we treat, not this. We're not yeah. here to get rid of feelings or get rid of thoughts or whatever, change other people's opinions about us. It's this is the part that we focus on. Do you yeah. do similar type of approach? Yeah. And, you know, it's, I'm going to say too, it's so different from person to person and there's no blanket treatment that fits everyone because especially when it comes to food and body image, each person has a different lived experience Mm -hmm. that has led them to their current relationship with food, body exercise, all of that. So it's really important to look at how did we get here? Let's process some emotions because honestly, most of the time too, you know, whether it's an eating disorder or whatever it is, it oftentimes is this like coping mechanism that develops and Mm -hmm. people, that's their kind of like safe way of coping, of getting some type of control. And that's not what we're treating. We need to look at why are we using these behaviors? Can we replace them with healthier behaviors? Can we process our emotions differently? So that way you don't even need to use this coping mechanism that's not necessarily the most helpful thing but yeah absolutely there's we don't look at and I hope like if there's anyone here who has a certain like diagnosis or disorder or whatever it is like I hope you know that we too as a treatment team like never look at we need to make this disorder go away and these are the mm-hmm. things we can tackle it's just dang what it yes. is. <laughs> yeah like you know how can we just better understand you and what you've gone through and how can we just help you get better tools, better ways to process certain difficult emotions. And Mm -hmm. ultimately that's, that's really it. It's not like making something go away or treating some illness. It's really just let's empower you more. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. (laughs) You guys, um, Marie said, I said earlier, using food as coping mechanism. Who did that? I I surely did that. (laughs) Very (laughs) kind can be for challenging emotions, but also for great emotions. I mean, who wants to have ice cream when you're happy? I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting with food, right? And it's so tricky because food is always available. It's Mm -hmm. non-toxic. Yeah. It's not harming you. It is cheap and Mm -hmm. nobody will stigmatize you for eating. So it's such an easy thing, such an easy go-to for for trying to deal with your emotions in an unhealthy way, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's one thing that's really important to point out too, is that food on its own just packs a lot of emotions because it's not always food, like certain cultures, um, food is a way to celebrate and certain Mm -hmm. cultures, food is a way to show love and care. And so um, there are emotions around food. Food is an emotional experience. And we need to know too, that, you know, if you are someone that uses food to, celebrate or to cope with some difficult emotions like anxiety or depression or boredom or anger or whatever it is that's not necessarily the problem the problem isn't I used food once I was happy I felt like I wanted to go get some ice cream I did it the like it becomes more of an issue when you only use food that is your only coping mechanism and 
what I work with patients on too, is that let's normalize using food as a coping mechanism. Like you absolutely can. However, is it your only coping mechanism? Because that's when we go into that gray area of, well, we're not really dealing with our emotions in the most helpful way because food will just numb. It's not really going to take you any further than that. So maybe in certain times you're like, I'm just going to, I'll deal with this tomorrow, tonight. I need to do this thing. Sure. But eventually you're going to have to deal with the underlying emotion. Um, so it can be a coping mechanism. However, if it's your only coping mechanism, then that's when we want to develop just more effective tools and just add them to your toolbox. Right. You tell, you work with a lot of people with that must or else mindset, like must do this or else. And then I have to yes. do and do and do and do and do it. And then, ah, then I'll be okay. And so that that's why I love this call because it's, it's all, it's the same yes. habit cycle. It's the same, yeah. how we attend to discomfort. And yes. this is my, I didn't get a chance to post this today. It probably won't come up till tomorrow, but we tend to get people that are very good at tolerating through how do I dare through this how do I beat this struggling with and it's actually those those words are the problem like yes. fighting through anxiety like got to fight through this situation and it's the fight that's actually creating the distress Absolutely. and so it's dropping that must or else it's it's letting go of the fight of it's it's more about growing your tolerance for something and yeah. your capacity for something rather than tolerating through something yeah, absolutely. See that food used as weapons or to fill certain needs. Yes. And- I mean, there's there's so many shoulds and musts and ought tos with food. And there's so much of that black or white thinking of, you mm-hmm. know, I need to do this and I need to do this perfectly and I need to power through this. And like you said, it's just more about living in that middle area, like building tolerance and self-talk is such a big important piece when we're working on helping someone go into a more peaceful relationship, their bodies with their food. If you're constantly just in a negative self-talk cycle, you give yourself no kindness, no room for error, no room for imperfection. That doesn't help your mental health at all Mm -hmm. when you're your worst critic and you're constantly just negative, negative, negative about yourself because no one's going to take care of you better than yourself and no one knows you more than yourself. So if you're your number one critic, that creates, you know, a lot of anxiety, a lot of negative emotions and those pile up and we use food and the cycle continues. Right. Same vicious as the anxiety loop. Yeah. <laughs> one question, Marie, do you, I'm sure you also get a lot of clients as we do who have lost trust in their body. And also maybe trusting their ability to actually hear their body, hear Mm -hmm. its cues, listen to it. And even if they do, there is still some fear of actually then surrendering trust and control back. So how do you tackle that in your practice? Yeah, you know, I would say most people come into the process of you know, healing your relationship with food, like intuitive eating, all of that with one foot in and one foot out the door. I guarantee you, no one ever comes in thinking this is going to work because it's, it's such a foreign concept right now in the society and the culture that we live in to trust your body and to Mm -hmm. think, well, I know what's best for me because we're constantly brainwashed into thinking, you can't trust yourself around uh, sweets or you can't trust yourself around this. You need to follow this diet. This diet knows mm-hmm. what you need. You don't know what you need. And so when you're brainwashed for so long, you absolutely lose trust in yourself and in your body. And when someone comes and tells you, oh, you can trust it again. You're like, what are you saying? What is this BS? I don't trust it. <laughs> so really step one is we work on the mental blocks and, you know, what's fully stopping you from trusting yourself again. And oftentimes I ask the question of you've tried everything else. What was the outcome? And oftentimes Mm -hmm. the outcome is we've tried everything else and nothing worked. So I always say, this is one more thing to try. Why not try it? And 99.9% of the time people are able to feel the difference and you know, the more that you practice breaking food rules and breaking old patterns and Mm -hmm. eliminating restriction and working on thoughts that you have about yourself and your food and those judgments, the more that you do that, you realize I actually had this knowledge. Like I actually know how to take care of myself. 
the more you connect with your body in that way and that you're kind with yourself, you start to see the other side of it and it kind of falls into place. But there is so much resistance at first. It's very, no, it's a normalized thing. And, you know, it's just part of the process. Michelle, does it sound familiar to you? I mean, it's like, like and that's why every time we have these calls, I say, you can take the word anxiety out of the equation and replace it with other things, whatever habit cycle there is, whatever feeling you're fighting. Another question came in this month. What about depression? I said, how do you treat the present feeling of sad? If you're in a battle struggling and making decisions on what you're doing the day based on the present feeling, whether it's anger or grief or happy yeah. or anxiety or whatever it's 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 the treatment of those things yeah that, that yeah. is usually rinse and repeat that's always the same sort of pattern that we see not what do I do about this sad absolutely it's what do I how are you treating this sad that's here you know yes yes absolutely and, and what, yeah. you know what's so funny because you said people people fear fear their body they fear that oh my god if I let go will my body do the thing that I don't want it to do? Mm-hmm. Will I turn into this binge eating monster? And in, in relation to anxiety, they say, if I allow this feeling, if I allow my body to do its thing, if I stop trying to control my bodily or my mental sensations, then they are going to overwhelm me because mm-hmm. I feel as long as I resist them, as long as I fight them, yeah. I'm doing something actively. And as long as I do that, I am the one keeping this at bay. And that moment when I let go, it's going to overwhelm me and I'm going to die or lose my mind, go crazy, whatever. And for your clients is, oh, I'm never going to stop eating again. <laughs> I'm never going to eat something healthy again. Absolutely. Right. You see yeah. guys, so similar. Or, or it's like, it always to us, it's always control, vulnerability and uncertainty. And so there's other things going on that are not in my control. There were things that had gone on in my past that were out of my control. And this is something I can control. And now I'm going to control this thing to try to control that thing. And so this becomes out of control. And I had two problems. Yeah. Now this thing to fix this problem became a problem. And now I've got, I still got this thing going on and now I have this thing. And then now I got to control this thing that's controlling this thing. And it's, And that's why it really takes this paradoxical opposite approach of not controlling it all. You grow trust back in yourself by kind of leaving it alone Mm -hmm. rather than doing more about it. Yes, absolutely. And I think people's like worst enemy is feeling your feelings. And I see that all the time with the people I work with, where the minute you start talking about let's just acknowledge this feeling. Let's make space for it. It's okay. Let's not push it away. And people get mad. Like, I don't want to feel my feelings. I just want to numb using mm-hmm. my, in my case food. It could be something else, but control. Again, we look at, you've done this before. How has this worked for you? How mm-hmm. has this served you? And people really do try to control their emotions so much to try and say like okay like I've got this everything else I don't have control over I have control over these things right, but right. eventually it blows up in your face because you just you can't control there's so much you can control and if right. you're not dealing with certain things and processing through them it's just gonna bottle up and bottle up and one day it's gonna like and yeah that won't be fun for everyone and then you feel so 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 hopeless and helpless because you have tried and you have put in so much time and all of your effort yeah. for it to blow up in your face and then you're like okay nothing is gonna yeah. help me like, I'm lost and I can't do it this is exceeding my my coping strategy so yeah. nothing is working for me and I find this is the people hit rock bottom and I'm so sad for them when they reach a point some need it some need it yeah. in order to let go right yeah, um, yeah but absolutely. but yeah what would be nice if we could make that the turnaround sooner right and do, do that's you, because I'll, it works for like a short period of time like it works exactly. or nobody yeah. would do it like if you give a kid a lollipop they stop crying until the lollipop's gone you just need an endless supply of lollipops and yeah. it just gets exhausting and frustrating and like because if you're constantly in survival mode you don't survive through feelings yeah. It's in the word, feel them. Whether again, whether you like them or not, some are unpleasant. And those are the yeah. ones we fight against. And we try and do something to feel better. Like this, I don't like this song on the radio. So I'm going to turn on a louder radio to not hear this song on the radio. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that's exactly it. And I think 
just like with diets, just like with everything, whatever you're trying to kind of use as like a self-soothing tool or a way to gain more control over your body or your food or whatever it is. The thing is it works short term. And that's, what's so tricky for people is they Mm -hmm. think that like, well, this is working, but eventually it stops working because the underlying issue is still there and we're not Mm -hmm. dealing with it. And it's just, everything else is just a short-term distraction. Mm -hmm. So we have a few questions that were submitted, Marie, um, but maybe before, before we head there, I have one last question. Can you, can you give me an example or how is it, how does people's general vibe change when they go through the process of learning to trust their body and they come out of the other side can you give us maybe an example of a client, how they were when they came in and how their life has changed yeah. after the process? Yeah, absolutely. I think really most people come into it feeling generally unhappy with their lives, unhappy with their eating patterns, feeling like this is it, like this is how it's going to be for forever but I'm not happy with it. I feel so much shame and guilt. And I think about food 24 seven and I look in the mirror 1100 times a day and I'm not happy with how I look and I can't show up for my family or my friends because I'm so preoccupied with this thing. So it really feels like rock bottom when people start because most of the time people have cycled through so many diets and remedies and little things that, you know, promise success, but don't deliver and people feel like a failure when they start and that's the most horrible feeling is when you feel like you failed yourself and physically speaking you know a lot of people come in too with a lot of anxiety a lot of depression sometimes like there's high blood pressure and high blood sugar and there's all of these co-occurring things and when you truly deal with difficult emotions and deal with stress and learn how to cope with stress better and learn how to approach food a little bit differently and learn to accept your body without necessarily liking it or feeling like, oh, I have to love this thing. Like when you really have this like radical acceptance of yourself, I think a lot of things switch and you see people go through the process and at the end, people like stop thinking about food all the time, stop thinking about their bodies all the time. Not to say there, there's not, you know, these little moments that pop up because obviously we live in a very diet culture centric society. There's going to be a million people around you who are not doing what you're doing. So there's going to be thoughts that pop up, but the goal is not acting on those thoughts, just embracing them saying, okay, like I'm just having a hard day today and that's fine. And there's a lot of peace that comes with that. People really feel like they can keep whatever food in their house now. And food doesn't feel like it has like so much power over you. And you can take pictures with your kid after you've just not been in pictures for three years. And you can do all of these things that were so scary. So I think really it just, at the end of the day, people just have more self-trust and more peace and knowing that this is who I am and I'm just going to stop trying to like, fix myself and yeah there's oh so my gosh you can just run our calls because <laughs> you know what's you so see, funny guys, it's, yeah. it's just it's a just slightly so, different it's, theme it's but it's the same, same thing yeah. the same and did you hear thing. all the words radical Except, acceptance yeah. surrender observe. I don't have to like it yes yes, yes. I don't yeah. have to like you but I can accept you you see, guys, this is uh, so, so the same. That's Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, I accept yeah. what I see, even if I don't like it and how that like body image in general, because this yeah. does come up a lot, like all the self-talk about like the stories we sell ourselves. Yeah. Like, what, what kind of work do you do with that? And what yeah. do you see comes up most common? Yes. Body image is tricky because I always say the food is easier to work on. The body image piece leaves you last and Mm -hmm. people don't like that because it's not a (laughs) fix and it's not something that just like gets resolved. Um, You know, you live in your body 24 seven, like that is your home. There's no way of escaping it. It's with you. So if you go through your days, um, dressing it with clothes that are super tight, just because you refuse to get something bigger, Um, you're pinching and you're like measuring yourself against other things and you're self-weighing a million times a week and you're doing all of these things. 
that is not a comfortable thing to do. And that is not a comfortable place to live. And so a lot of the work that we do around body image is really just understanding how did your relationship with your body get to this point? And usually like there is sometimes there's trauma, there's, oh, my mom put me on a diet and we went to Weight Watchers mm-hmm. when I was 12 years old. And so we, we are never really born like hating our bodies, but at some point something happens and we get this different message of something's wrong with you. You need to fix it. Right, right. And so really understanding what happened, knowing that that was problematic, because sometimes people come in and say, you know, I never noticed that that's what happened in my house growing up and that that something was wrong with that because everyone was doing it. And so it's, it's like, name it to tame it. Sometimes Mm -hmm. people just need to name the things that happen and realize that, okay, like that wasn't very helpful for me. And then from there, doing a lot of work on self-talk doing a lot of work around how not to punish your body on bad body image days so things like if you are having a rough day make sure you're wearing loose clothes because if something's feeling tight on you your attention is gonna be on your body the entire day because you're gonna feel uncomfortable Mm -hmm. um use some helpful coping mechanisms still speak to yourself kindly and rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat (laughs) and again this like idea that we're all supposed to like love our bodies and body positivity and all of that. That's harmful messaging in a sense, because rarely can you find someone who is just like, oh, I love this a hundred percent. Like, I don't want to change anything. You can have that want to change it, but are you acting on it? Like, that's the most important thing. And again, understanding that radical acceptance is this is how I am. I don't have to like it. I don't have to love it. I don't even have to be okay with it, Mm -hmm. but just acknowledging like, all right, like this is it. And I just have to go through life being me and existing in this body and whatever happens like happens, but I'm just going to stop fighting because it's a fight that most of the time you just can't win. And so just like, yeah, this is me and just moving on. You know, I find it so 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 great that that you point out this this whole body positivity thing because it can be toxic. And I I always say, you know, when it comes to self love or body positivity, it's a it's a far stretch to go from self hate and I really do not like what I see to I love myself. No, I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't need to talk my way into into loving um, my body when I don't. But I think, and everybody who has children can attest to this, you love your children more than anything in the world, but sometimes they stink and they look ugly. You don't yeah. love them, right? You don't love them less. That's our new dare shirt. Some, we love our kids, but sometimes they stink and look ugly. Dare. <laughs> and they're annoying and all these things, but we still love them. And I think that's yeah. a good analogy because it's the same yeah. with our body. Right? We cannot like how we look, but we can still accept it and treat it, treat it kindly and Okay, let, let's stick with respectfully, not even kindly. Okay, yeah, start yeah. with respect. That, that's, that's a good a, word. Yeah, a, a good Absolutely. place, and and see how it develops from there. Because usually, as Marie said, and as you guys all know, when acceptance happens, then it opens up the door for a new universe of possibilities. Really, something yeah. we right. we sometimes never imagine is is possible. Yeah, right. and Absolutely. acceptance teaches you how to leave shit alone that you don't get to change anyway. I don't like my giant forehead. You guys think I like wearing bangs since I was five years old? I hate it. I don't like it. Oh, fucking well. That's really like the overall mindset. You don't try really hard to get there. You just notice what you don't like and leave it alone. And like a lot of things we teach in dare is how to leave shit alone. We have people that are not good at leaving things alone. It's like, I'm trying to leave it alone, trying is that, okay, I'm leaving it alone. Is it still there? I'm leaving yeah. it alone. Is it gone yet? And it's like, leave it be, leave it alone while it gets to stay. You don't have to like every part of your body. And I, I love that you said that too, because it's like, I need to tell myself I'm beautiful all day long. Yeah. How about just leave yourself alone? Because people that aren't stuck there aren't, aren't not stuck there because they're saying all those things to themselves yeah. all day long. They really are just leaving themselves alone. Yes, exactly. And you know, something really important that you said too, is 
you really don't have much control over your body and how you look. And some people think that they do. And some people think that like food and exercise is like a hundred percent of what goes into your body shape and size. And that if you control those, everything's going to be fine, but really food and nutrition and exercise clump together. It's just 20 to 30% of why you look the way you look. Everything else is nothing you can control. It's literally like you have no control over it. And so leave it alone. And honestly, the best thing you can do for yourself is not standing in front of the mirror and saying like, oh, I'm beautiful and I'm this and that. And if it works for you, great. But for most people, it feels weird and it feels Mm -hmm. natural. Don't look in the mirror. Maybe say, I'm just going to spend a second just to see if my outfit matches and then I'm going to leave. I'm not going to sit in front of the mirror for so long and just simmer and just look at myself the whole time. Like, so yeah, you just leave it alone and you try not to think about it the whole time. And you do every other thing that's more important in life than like standing on a scale and looking in the mirror and mm-hmm. poking at whatever you don't like. Cause like, right. that's because, funny. because when we get stuck in this thing, as long as these numbers are okay and this looks okay, ah, then I'm okay. As opposed to if this is always fluctuating, then your okayness will always be fluctuating yeah. and get okay while this fluctuates. Yes. And um, Randall made a great point there because he in the chat wrote, I also radically accept that your kids are smelly and ugly, which thank you because brings up a good point of we, not only are we trying to control our own thoughts and feelings and sensations, but as, with about with even just recently, I've had a few calls about body image as well. And it's other people's opinions of my body. And if you don't get to control your own thoughts, feelings, sensations, you sure as hell cannot control other people's. No. Does that come up a lot? Like, yeah, it's always doing things. As long as you think this about me, then I'm okay. So you're in a constant trying to make everything look okay or be okay. So other people can say it's okay. Yes, absolutely. Like I constantly have folks who, um, or let's say I've been on their own, their parents are coming to visit and they're like, I can't have these things in the house because my mom is going to see this and she's going to think that I'm a bad person. And I'm eating this. I mean, nah, nah, nah. and again, like you can't control other people's opinions of you and mm-hmm. you're not responsible for other people's opinions of right. you either. So you're not responsible for trying to have someone else's opinion be better. And mm-hmm. same thing goes right now. Like it's the summer. I can't wear this to the beach. People are going to yep. think this, people are going to think that 99% of the time people aren't thinking about you because they're too busy worrying about thinking themselves. about themselves <laughs> think about you. It's maybe a fleeting thought and it's one second long and it's just, they're going to go back to worrying about whatever it is and paying attention to something else. So again, most of the time it's just us being stuck in our heads and thinking that, oh my gosh, everyone's looking at me. Everyone's thinking this. And then worst case scenario and they're thinking this and what Mm -hmm, does that mm -hmm. and the minute you just are okay with the thought that you know just because someone has an opinion about me doesn't mean it's true that's really when you start to be more okay with showing up authentically just how you are because people are gonna have something to say most of the time people aren't super nice does that make it true and if you truly accept yourself, you just don't care. Absolutely. Yeah, that's where that yeah, fucking mindset comes yeah. in, really. Look I mean, what that's my the... hairdresser did to me. <laughs> Look at that. What is this? This is awful. Look what you did. Call me out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you like, your hairdresser on the webinar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, you know, I think our appearance and the way we look and how yeah. other people perceive us, it's, it's so emotionally charged and it has been for so many decades. So it's, I think it's impossible to escape it. And that's another thing that I find toxic some, sometimes about the anti-diet culture as well is mm-hmm. to try and be immune against it or the other extreme that sometimes the message comes across as, oh, you know what, you, you don't need to care how you look at all and don't yeah. have any body goals. I think that's wrong too, because Again, guys, the intention matters. We say this all the time. You can use all the dear tools, all the therapeutic tools in the world and turn them into weapons against yourself. Or you Mm -hmm. can use them as tools to to reach your 
your goals. If you can have fitness goals, you can have strength goals. If you do that because you enjoy your body and what your body can do, that is awesome. If you only go and exercise because you want to to shred or slim down so other people will think of you more highly or because you're socially more desirable, I don't think this is going to feel good on the inside. It's going to feel good. And then it never ends. Never. Never. There's no end there. Yeah. No, it, and you will always, even if you get that attention momentarily, and you're like, oh, I feel so hot. This is also awesome. okay. Everybody's looking at me. You go home yeah. and you're alone there, maybe. And usually nothing in your life changes. You'll still have the same friends, the same partners, the same family, the same you, your same thoughts. Nothing is going to change, right? You're going to be yeah. the same person. You might feel better about yourself. If you do that with the right intention, it's going to add to your. Uh, quality of life and if you do something yeah. that you feel is draining your energy and you will know the difference you know when you use dare to fight it it feels exhausting <laughs> yeah. at the end of the day and when you diet and you exercise just slim down so you're more pleasing uh, th- to the outside world it's going to drain your energy it's not going to be fulfilling right? yeah so many absolutely. similarities here yes yes absolutely yeah. intention is everything honestly yeah. Yeah. We have a great question that came in. Oop, Claudia sent in this great um, question here. Advice on how to speak to tweens, spe- uh, especially girls about their body. So they can, and boys, I'm going to throw that in there too. Yeah. So they can learn how to accept their bodies at a young age. Because even though we don't hear a lot about the boys, it's just as important about the girls. It's just another yeah. social thing that doesn't get spoken Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, body image struggles, exist in both they just manifest in different ways Mm -hmm. with girls it's usually like looking pretty looking thinner and with guys it's looking stronger and so it's definitely there it just shows up differently for both um I think really with parents especially modeling that behavior is the most important thing because you could be telling your kiddo how um strong they are and special they are and whatever and you're standing in the mirror the next minute going like these rolls and I need to do I -hmm. can't wear this bathing suit because like and then the fat and then the cellulite and then this and they pick up on it kids as young as four years old have eating disorders so it really they pick up on it and they pick up on it at a very young age and so I think modeling positive behavior around your body is very important and that doesn't mean again like oh I love my body that just means like don't talk about it (laughs) be like you're going to the beach there's more stuff to talk about than your body um talking to girls like just compliment their other qualities that have nothing to do with appearance and then have Mm -hmm. that be the center of attention because really you don't need to be talking about their bodies. And if you notice them talking about their body, I would just get curious because most of the time, the messaging that is being said is picked up from somewhere and you don't want to be like shutting it down with the toxic positivity right away. You're like, no, Mm -hmm. but you're so pretty because that's not exactly. That's not the point. I would just get curious and say like, I wonder, you know, why are you feeling that way? Like, where is that coming from? And 99% Mm -hmm. of the time, especially with teenage kiddos, they're going to be like, well, my friend did them and said this, no, I saw this on TV. And then really just having the conversation around, you know, the purpose is not to look pretty or look thin or do this. Like you have so much more to offer. That's not what matters in life. Your capabilities, your personality, like all of that makes you a better person. And just really just kind of like moving the conversation away from bodies is what you want to be doing. And with food too, like that is very connected with bodies. So if you're like, I'm not going to eat this because this makes, or I'm only going to have half of this dessert because I don't want to, they, that is very important as well. So again, modeling positive food behaviors is also super important. Mm -hmm. That's How about social life. media, the role of social media? It's, it's a oh disaster, which is kind of ironic because we'll have, we get a lot of clients who are comparing all the filters and the photoshops and the airbrushing to how they think they're supposed to look when they don't even look like that. The oh Instagram models don't even look like that. But no. then we also get those Instagram people who are also struggling with holding up a certain image because that's not, and they're falling apart on the inside. And this is what they're putting out there is not the real them. So we get the people who are comparing themselves to these 
very well-known people on Instagram and the people on Instagram <laughs> who are trying to hold up this. And it's all the same sort of battle. It is. And, you know, with social media too, if your kids are young, you can, you know, you can move them away from that. But at some point, especially right now, like kids have access to all of that. Right. So I would just really encourage, especially with social media, is making sure that your kiddos are following accounts of people who look, you know, all different kinds of ways of different abilities of, you know, you want your kids to see that people come in different shapes and sizes and that's okay. You don't want them to be following like the Fitspo accounts and all of that. And the accounts that really make them feel shit about themselves. Cause that's not going to do anyone any good. You want to make sure they're following people who model positive behaviors. And honestly, with social media, like when I start working with folks, the first thing I do is if they use social media is let's declutter, let's delete all of the accounts that make you feel like your life isn't good enough, that your body's good enough. Let's follow things that you're passionate about. Like if you like pets, let's follow pet accounts. Mm-hmm. If you like art, let's follow art accounts. Like right. let's use social media as a way to like look at positive things that right. feel good rather than have all that toxic stuff pop up on your feed every day. And there are a lot of people out there who do amazing body image stuff, all different shapes and sizes. Like let's just introduce that into our lives and try and step away as much as we can from the accounts that are like very diet culture, you very like, you know, look at me. And I'm, and again, explaining that, like, these people don't even look like themselves. And right. they don't even look a like, lot them. Of resources <laughs> of, like models, like having eating disorders, sharing how they're unhappy with themselves, talking about how they're airbrushed and shoots and how they don't even look like themselves. So also just talking mm-hmm. about, you know, what you see is not what you get. And just really building that awareness, especially around social media, because people can believe like, oh, well, this is how it is, but it's, it's, it never is. Mm -hmm. Mm. That's such great messaging. And I think really, what is the first step? Like you guys, if you can take one thing from today, I hope that you can see that everything starts with acceptance. Yes. And I like how, how Marie said, radical acceptance. You hear us say this all the time. You cannot say, I accept 80%, 20%. Yeah. Ah, let's see about that. It doesn't yeah. work like that because those 20%, they will haunt you in some form. And I believe it's the same maybe with, with food. If somebody, let's say, comes to you and stops calorie, calorie counting and says, I'm committed to learning to intuitively eat, but then secretly it's like, okay, I've eaten intuitively, but... Now, just let me check the calories yeah, after right. I ate it. You see, that, yeah. that is also another form of control. So yeah. radical acceptance and, and starting there and seeing wh- where that, that gets you, right? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah, there can't be any ifs and buts in there. It's just no, no expectations, no, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll radically accept, accept myself after I lose 20 pounds or once this happens, or if I feel this way, then like I accept the good feelings. You don't get to like pick and choose what you accept. This you accept the whole deal. It's like a, it's like a whole show there. If if it would be good things, acceptance wouldn't be needed. It would come, you know, automatically, but it's the shit we need to accept the uncomfortable stuff, unfortunately. Absolutely. It gets easier. It really gets easier. Don't don't you find that? If you yeah, because you use all that energy for useful things, then instead of spending so much energy, that's where like, do you get a, by the time you get a lot of uh, clients, like, by the time we get them, they are exhausted, yeah. and completely frustrated. And then usually those two combined over a period of time comes with this sense of like, I must be broken. Yes. Because I've tried all these things. I've done all this stuff. I'm, I, I didn't mind getting really exhausted because it was going towards something, but now I'm frustrated because the exhaustion served no purpose. There must just be something inherently wrong with me. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then again, you go into that cycle and you self-destruct and you're like, well, I have to fix myself and here's how I'm going to do it. And usually those are short term and they don't work and you feel even worse. And it's, Cycle. You know, and the worst thing is this, this constant preoccupation with that, like 80% of your energy, no matter what you do, you're never fully present because in the back of your head, there's, yeah. there's something going on because you need to find something out. You need to fix something. I think this is just a too high price to pay. It is. Everything it is. Really, right? Mental real estate is not <laughs> unlimited. And it's exhausting yeah. to constantly be in your head and worried and yes. stressed. It's just yeah. not a good life to live. 
Yeah. And we have another question that came in here wow. and it's, it's, it's such a good, it's so easy. Like I could take my little red pen and mark it all up. I can't get rid of the thought already. My red pen can't get rid of the thought, right? Our last webinar with Dr. Winston, you're right. Can't get rid of thoughts. I can't get rid of the thought of I may go bald and then no one might like me. How will I react if I go bald? perfect example of how that kind of process works. First of all, you don't need to get rid of any sort of thought. You yeah. can notice the thought of an idea of something that could happen. This is when we talk about the what ifs. It could, yeah. I can go bald, you can go bald. You may go bald. The answer is, yeah, I might go bald. But Imagine us going bald on our next webinar. I'm the sure next webinar. Me. Oh my God, I should have said hello. Look, we all went bald. <laughs> no. <laughs> and so, but again, and then no one might like me. So that's your imagination of that scenario. And now you're trying to figure out what to do now about what- Try to control, right? Trying to control, worst case. Going, try and control a thought, trying yeah. to control baldness, and then try to control what other people think about my baldness. Yes. Good, Good luck. luck with all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's- it's a lot you... and not to minimize right how how awful this thought feels and how real the fear is because yeah. obviously you know baldness is not what society is looking for in men or women necessarily so it's normal that you would have the thought and fear it what is not normal uh, normal yes but not helpful is mm. you doing that second part right that oh god but i don't want to go bald yeah. Now, and I don't want to have the thought, how can I get rid of the thought? And how can I, can I avoid becoming bald? Yeah. Those are the two things that you can control, right? Those are the, and those are the two things you're trying to control and that exhausts you completely because it leaves you nowhere. It's not going to work ever, 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 no matter how hard yeah. you try. And that is not because you're not trying hard enough. You're not good enough. We have the one technique because by nature, it is not possible. Right? So it's right. a waste of time. And that's where it, the answer to that is, then I go bald. What if I go bald? Then I'll be bald yeah. and I'll be yeah. one sexy bald person. Oh, I like, wear a wig. And I will just be bald rather yeah. than bald means something. It's yeah, I'm bald, period. Yes. Mm, it gets this yes. because yeah. there's no, you, you're bald, you're bald, but mm -hmm. then somebody else might just leave it alone. And somebody else has a story, has shame because they attach a meaning to it. The perception of it is different. And that's the stuff we're trying to, to get to here. Whether again, whether we're talking about eating or yeah. thoughts, or we had Dr. Gupta on the other day, on a couple of months ago about hearts, like it's all, it's the story we tell the, the pressure we put on ourselves. And really it's all of us spending a lot of time trying to control this stuff to actually try and control this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, going back to most of the time we're attaching meaning to something when other people don't care. And I'll give you an example, whether it's going bald or people always say that too with like, well, what if I gain weight? No one's going to like me. No one's going to do that. All these bad things are going to happen. But then let's say, imagine the person you care about the most in this world and they go bald or they gain weight. Are you going to stop loving them all of a sudden? Are you going to think that they're horrible people? You're probably not going to care and you're probably going to be supportive and it's just going to be something that happens and you're going to move on. So most of the time, we're our worst critics. We are just catastrophizing everything. We're going to think that this is the worst thing ever because we attach so much meaning to it. So again, like going back to why do I care so much? Who taught me to care so much? Oh, Society. Society attaches meaning to stupid things like hair. Okay. So how can I break that thought? Like, what are my values? Are my values going to change if I go bald? Like if I value, I don't know, health, am I going to become unhealthy if I go bald? If I value time with family, am I not going to spend time with my family if I go bald? So again, just really, where did that thought come from? Why am I putting so much meaning and value into this? Is this who I want to be? Does it really align with my values? And again, it may happen. It may not happen. And then what? Right. And tell you, and start telling different stories, right? Yes. As opposed to black and white stories. Yes. If this happens, then this will happen. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. 
or this could happen, or this could happen, or or even more terrible things could happen, yeah. or good things can happen. But either way, like most of our calls are a lot of people living here trying to control there or trying to control back there. Absolutely. And and it's like, be here. Like our yeah. job is to teach you how to just be more here and yeah. remember there, mm -hmm. think about what if there, but it's the present battle mm. that kind of keeps this all cranking out. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I, I love what, what you said, you know, about values. And we talk about values in relation to, to anxiety a lot, but, but in, in, in relation to, to food and, and body image and not, I would like to invite you all to take a moment and just, just reflect on your values in regards of how would you like to feel, not so much how would you like to, to look. Right? Mm -hmm. I think that's a good place to start. For example, I value for me, it's very, very important to be flexible. Now, I had gained a lot of weight during COVID. And I'm telling you that jog that I did, it was so sad <laughs> because I was, my body was hurting and I didn't like that. I didn't mind the pounds, but I didn't mind how I felt because I was not flexible. Just walking didn't feel good. Right? So me losing a bit of that weight, now I feel better. I'm not dressing differently. And I went to swim with those pounds too. And I'm going to go to swim now. You see, it's not so much about the looks, but how do you want to feel? And what do you want to do with your body in your life? Is your body weight allowing you to live your values? It, either that be sports or stuff with your family. Think in those terms and less in terms of how can I add to, to my appearance? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you also see a lot of um, when the shame and the judgment comes up, if, if somebody does it the wrong way, did the wrong thing, binged, purged, engaged in the old behavior and what the situation is over, but then we have this, a great dare alumni who coined this term collateral damage yeah. and, and the collateral damage that was done afterwards, like whatever the situation was. I binged, I purged, yeah. whatever it was, might've lasted this much time. And then days, weeks after that of what's wrong with you, you're such a stupid yeah. idiot. You're never going to get this. Do you, yeah. do you see a similar pattern come oh. up of where, yeah. And, which is almost true. worse than, which is usually worse it than is. the thing that it happened. Is. Absolutely. It is worse. And, you know, we often tell, well, I'm going to take like the eating disorder example of like, oh, I binge or purge or whatever. And people are telling us this and we're like, it's fine. Like mm -hmm. we as a team are normalizing it for you. And we're saying it's okay. It clearly happened because your body had a need. And the only way you knew how to fulfill it with mm -hmm. through using a familiar behavior, that's how you had control in that moment. Mm -hmm. But then we're saying it's fine. And you're still like blaming and shaming mm -hmm, and guilty mm -hmm. yourself, which is never helpful. And I really try to say like, let's just do the next best thing. Like this happened, acknowledge it. Okay. You feel bad in the moment. Don't let yourself simmer in that for too long. Just say like, how can I move on and do the next best thing for me? Not the right thing, but right. the next best thing, which for you, the next best thing could be, I'm going to go distract myself and do this some like activity that I like, because I can't keep like sitting here and ruminating on that thought and the behavior. And Yes, like the shame and the guilt, no matter what the behavior is, is never helpful. Mm -hmm. The way we talk to ourselves when things don't go our way is just so destructive and it's not helpful and it doesn't really help you move on. It doesn't do you any good. Like there are going to be slip ups with whatever journey you're on. It's not going to be perfect. There's going to be things that happen that you don't like that don't go your way in life even. And if you think about it too much and you worry about it and you're constantly like, oh no, oh no, I did this. I feel so bad. Mm -hmm. You're just going to be stuck there. You're going to miss the present moment. You're going to feel crappy about yourself. And then you're going to try and like go and again, going back to that cycle of like, oh, I feel so bad. I'm going to use this unhelpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, going back to acceptance, like, you know what? Yeah, this happened and it sucked and I'm not happy with it, but I took five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour right. a day to feel my feelings. I need to move on and do something. Right. And to feel sorry for myself. Right? Yeah. I always say that to my client. Party yeah, over for yourself. Yeah. Right? Do yeah. that. Complain, whine, cry until it gets boring. 
Absolutely. And then you pick yourself right. up and you move on. Fail fast, you guys. Yeah. Right? Fail fast. And, <laughs> and you guys on the chat, what are my two favorite words? Who, who, who's heard me enough times? You know my two favorite words. Yeah. What are my other two favorite yeah. words? What's my on, other two right favorite now. words? Yeah. What are my two real favorite words? Yeah. Oh, fuck that. No, that's, that's no. one too. No, no one, shut you. up. Now what? <laughs> now what? <laughs> now what? Oh, I did this thing. Oh, I ran out of the grocery store because I had a panic attack. Oh, okay. Now what? Yeah. Now what? It's over. Yeah. It's over. Oh, oh, you did that. Oh, okay. Oh, you didn't want to do that, but you did that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now what? Yeah. Oh, you're now what is you're still staring at the thing that you did. Well, that's not yeah. helpful. So yeah. it's, that's done. Now what? And so mm -hmm. if you're now what is still keeping your head back there off into there, be more here. And so it's really less important about your why you have so many favorite two words. Apparently I do. <laughs> it's not shut up though. I don't say shut up, but now what really important. It's really less like what am I doing and why am I doing it rather than why am I feeling this way again? Why is it back? Why, why did I have this thought? It's what am I doing and why am I doing it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Intention. It, and I heard the, the, uh, uh, a phrase the other day, which I found so great. Uh, it said, it is not your fault, but it is your responsibility. I like mm -hmm. that so much. Mm -hmm. right, nobody, nobody was chose to have body image issues or anxiety or eating disordered or disordered eating it happened right something triggered it yeah. now what now but what it's our responsibility to 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 make it right right Absolutely. So we're going to leave you with that quote i think right it's not your yeah. fault have we missed anything important marie elena that you want, oh, yeah. that you really uh, want to make sure people know or a, a message that gets sent out or that we might you know, have missed i'm just this kind of to answer Claudia's question too, and this really is like the message that I would leave you with as well is I would just think big picture. You know, if you think that what you're doing in the moment might cause harm to you or to someone else, like big picture example, like with the kids, like what's the point? Like, is the point, like, is the big picture, do you want them to have a good relationship with their body and their food? Or big picture, do you want them to look a certain way? And those things are very different. Mm -hmm. And again, control usually doesn't lead to very good places. And the more we try to control, things get out of hand and it's not very helpful. So I would just think of your intention behind everything that you're trying to do. And there's so many things you can control and there's things you can't control. Food is not something that you can control. If you want to eat, eat stuff that satisfies you, eat stuff that makes you happy, that feels good. Different times are going to call for different foods. Sometimes you need energy and you're going to pick foods that give you energy. And sometimes you just want something that is going to be like, yeah, this hits the spot. And it's probably not going to be an apple. And that's okay. <laughs> there's, like, there's jobs to all the foods. All foods can like have a certain function, can play a different role for your body and control is just not very helpful because the other flip side of that is you're going to lose control at some point and that is just not not going to look fantastic you know <laughs> nobody's going to be as motivated as today to have mac and cheese right <laughs> <laughs> today's going to be that day. who is excited to cook tonight <laughs> Something really good, whatever you crave. And never excited good. to cook tonight. <laughs> oh, come on, Michelle. <laughs> You're no fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cool. This was a great call. Thank you so yes. much for coming Thank on. You You'll have to come on again. Yeah. yeah, it was so fun chatting with you all. And it, it's, it really is amazing. It never gets old to see like, there's just so many similarities and you can replace food with literally whatever word. And it's just the same cycles, which is a good thing for everyone on here to know too, is that. Yes. You don't have two different problems. You have. Yeah. Right. Yes. You can apply it everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. And well, if people so, wanted to get in yeah. touch with you, where, where can they find you? Right. Yeah. So if you um, are more of a website person, you can go to www.beyondfoodrules.com. And if you're a social media person, my handle is Beyond Food Rules, literally everywhere you can message me. And if you want to email me, you can also do that. It's beyondfoodrules at gmail.com. So basically, if you forget, 
just dump me on food roll somewhere and you'll find me and you can get in contact with me. And yes. you do one-to-one -one coaching or any other? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I do one-to-one -one coaching and I have um, like online programs for people who don't have time for coaching. So there's something for everyone. Um, and even if you don't want coaching or anything like that, you have a question, like, please feel free to pop in and ask. Oh, that's so nice. Awesome. You guys, if you have a program so like that, maybe you could do what as you as a masterclass on, on our app. Yes, 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 yes. Let's stay in touch. That would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both so much for having me. Thank oh, you. Thanks for coming. Mary. Guys, thank everybody, you, everybody in the chat, thanks for showing up. Bye, Hopefully everyone. Thank helpful. you. Till next Take time. Take care. Bye. Oh, bye. Thank you for listening to the D.A.R.E. podcast. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is helping people all around the world to overcome anxiety and panic attacks. You can download the app for free at DareResponse.com.